Let's go ahead and get ourselves started. We're going to talk about lots of different things to get you ready for uh, completing the assignment and give you some updates on things we've uploaded to make it a little bit easier for you. Let's start out with the whole issue of like where you even get the software because there was a little bit of confusion about the software <laughs> and kind of where you can download it. And where that all happens is at students.autodesk.com. But there's sort of a very important little kind of a hitch in that I want to show you about. And it's really just has to do with the naming of the products. Watch this. I'll go to students.autodesk.com. <coughs> and I can log myself in. Yeah. Yes. Actually, if you already have like 2011 or 2012 installed on your machine, use that instead. Just go ahead and pull forward. You just, it's, you can never go back. So actually, if you want to go forward, because <coughs> you already have it installed, just download those instead. Yeah, because there's, there's, in fact, everything will just get easier. Exactly, because that was actually one of the significant changes, and we'll I'll, I'll sh talk about that in just a sec. But no, there was definitely a big, uh, issue in terms of a change between the 2010 and the 2011 versions. It turns out one of the changes that happened between 2010 and 2011 was they introduced the copying of the plumbing fixtures. <laughs> you know, so we get walls, columns, grids, and all those things in 2010, but the plumbing fixtures didn't get copied. When I was doing my tutorials, I did them all in 2011, so I'm, of course, thinking that's, you know, it just happens automatically. So what we've actually done for you is out on the, uh, if you go to coursework and you download uh, the assignment files again, there's a new version of the MEP file in there that actually has the, the, the toilets and the urinals and the sinks already in there, which then makes it very easy to sort of pick up and start uh, running the piping and stuff like that. So you won't have to worry about the copy monitoring part. We sort of took that part out of the equation to make it a little bit easier. But when you go out there and grab your software and you go to the free software section, <coughs> You are going to find things like, oh, Revit architecture and Revit structure down there, but Revit MEP isn't listed. And the problem is it's actually right up there instead. It's just a funny naming thing, and I have no idea why it's named this way. Those are Autodesk Revit architecture and Revit structure, but it's AutoCAD Revit MEP. Go figure. <laughs> you know, I, it makes no sense to me. But go ahead and choose whichever version you want. Again, 2010, 2011, 2012. We're working actually on getting the licenses in this room sort of updated. So if you want to start moving forward to 2011 or 2012, actually, don't, there's no reason to go to 2011. If you're going to move forward, just go to 2012 and install that on your machine. And any of the files um, that I'm uploading as 2010 versions, you can bring into 2012. And the big restriction will always be just that you need to work on, on your machine, not on these machines. But you know, go <laughs> ahead and move forward. The, the features keep on getting better, and that's going to be true of um, Revit, you know, architecture, structure, MEP. Today I'm going to show uh, Navisworks, okay, which is another very good tool for helping to resolve things between several different files. Um, you're not required to do that for the assignment this time. You're going to use it for the next assignment. So if you want to get a head start, download that one too. Okay, so that's the story with Revit MEP. Go ahead and grab that. Always watch out for this thing too, although I'm not sure if there's a difference in here. On some versions, there's uh, some programs there is a difference between the 32-bit and the 64-bit version. So know what kind of operating system you're operating on, whether you have a 32-bit or a 64-bit version of Windows, so you get the right one because it gets unhappy if you put the the wrong one on there. Okay, so let me go ahead and close that up. Let me just kind of show you over on coursework. We'll get that done too. If you log in there. And you go to materials, and what am I looking at? I'm not in the right place. Materials there. Under session 14, which is when I first handed out the assignment, I'll post this self announcement, announce an announcement about this for everybody. But under session 14, there's actually a <coughs> slightly newer version of it right there. Posted by Luis. Interesting. He must have posted the original. Oh, he did post the original. I updated it today at 9.29. So if you up out, bring that down, what you're going to find is there's a slightly updated version of the architectural model, but you don't really need to worry about that because you're not changing the architectural model. 
there is an updated version of the uh, MEP model. The MEP model now has the plumbing fixtures already copied into it, so you don't need to worry about that. You can just sort of start working with a riser and putting some mains in and linking them to that. So if you haven't gotten started yet, go ahead and pull that one in. There's also, I think there's an updated version of the structural in there where I've copied the grids in, okay, as well as the levels. So um, go ahead and download it if you haven't got that started, so you can work with all the latest, greatest. Okay, <coughs> let's go ahead and close that back up. And instead, just go in to the different programs and sort of talk about how they're going to be working together. And you know, we'll sort of experiment a little bit with a little uh, MEP and structure and kind of how they're all working together. And really what we're going to start talking about today is really if we have different sorts of consultants working in architecture, MEP, and structure, how we can bring their work back together and actually make sure that it's resolving nicely, if there aren't conflicts between the work spatially and what we do you know, when we find those kind of conflicts. So to get ourselves started, let's go ahead and just start over in, oh, where am I going to be? Let me go over to Revit Structure first. For you, if you want to follow along with the classes today, Go on out to the L drive, and if you go out to the L drive, hmm, where is it? <laughs> oh, there it is. If you go out to the L drive and go way out to the top under session 16, you'll find a bunch of files there that are available to you. If you want to open those up, I'm going to be opening up first the structural model, then the MEP model. I'm going to open up a version that has some more ductwork to be placed, so we can sort of play with that just a little bit together. <coughs> and then what we're going to do is take these things and try just running some interference checks amongst these different models to see just if there are clashes and really what we have to pay attention to. There's also a series of NWC files. Those are form files that have been um, exported from Revit for use in Navisworks. And we're going to play around in Navisworks also in terms of bringing those forward and kind of looking at a special tool within there called Clash Detective which is, it's kind of one step better than what you can do directly in Revit, because in Revit we're going to find that we can look at clashes on a, like, what, in a binary way. We can say, look at one file versus another file and compare things, but we can't really do three-way or four-way. Where Navisworks is a much fuller, much more capable tool where we can bring in lots of different files in different formats and do the comparison. So it's really that same sort of interference checking, but in a much broader, generalizable way. So. Let me go ahead and start off just, uh, I want to look at the architectural model first, since that really hasn't changed a whole lot. If you look at the architectural model and you download the latest version, though, you will find that in the floor plans and just any of the model views, there are slightly different fixtures in there. And again, what are those fixtures? Those are just fixtures <coughs> that have the MEP connections on them. Okay, but don't need to worry about that. That's already sort of exported for you. If I switch over to the structural model, let me just kind of show you kind of a starting point in terms of what's going on. So here's one version of the structural model. In this case, I was doing it out of concrete, which is not really probably the way to do it. I think I asked you in the assignment to go ahead and do it out of steel, but I want to come up with a real quick example that will have some clashes in it. And if I put my big concrete beams in, I'm going to have some clashes pretty quickly. So what I've done here is really just on the first floor level over on the left-hand side, just put some columns at the grid line locations and then just connected together with some beams. Okay, and in terms of these beams and the sizes of them and stuff like that, they're just some standard size beams. In my thinking, my intuition, I made these a little bit bigger. Those are like a 32 inches deep, whereas these going this way are only 24 inches deep. But there's not really a whole lot of analysis behind that just yet. That's kind of typical as we get started, we're in the next assignment going to take that same kind of model into an analysis program and actually size up the beams and be able to, from the analysis results, change those. Okay, so we'll get to that. So in terms of this, this is just really basic uh, kind of columns and uh, beams. You know, we could add some more beam systems in here to kind of subdivide it. If we don't think that our plate can really span 20 by 20, we can subdivide that with some smaller beams. Um, there's also no bracing in this scheme. Well, as a concrete system, it probably wouldn't need that. If we had a steel system, we might have some K bracing or just some sort of bracing to kind of keep it up. Although, <coughs> even in this whole scheme, you know, this building was sort of designed with the idea that this core, you know, which is supposed to be a concrete sort of structure, that that might actually be providing a lot of the lateral resistance, like for the building, and we can tie into that. But that's the, where I got started with it. It's just sort of a pretty simple little structure, and I've only done it on the first floor now. 
From this point, I could keep on going and copy and paste the line that up to the other floors and keep going. But I just want to sort of get this much out there so we can start to see how the models interact. So the big thing to note is 32 inch deep beams, 24 inch deep beams there, and we'll proceed from there. Now, actually, as we get going with that system, or moving to the next system, let's just kind of talk, you know, I'm putting it in context for you. Because I actually sort of saw a really good example of how hard it is for multidisciplinary teams to work you know, when I was working with uh, the PBL lab class, the global AAC class last year. In that, what happens is very often the architect will start driving the whole process and come up with the form of what they want to have in there. And as all the different subdisciplines start working together, you know, there really is a sort of issue about when you start working together <coughs> and who is driving at what point. Because what happened for one team was the architect sort of put together what they wanted, including some big open spans, and the structural engineer was going to optimize next. And the structural engineer went through and decided that, well, OK, we want to go ahead and have just a very efficient structure. So they put in these very, very deep beams, okay, very high depth beams, okay, which was kind of OK. You know, it sort of worked within the notion of what the floor to floor height that the architect was trying to achieve. But for the poor MEP engineer who came along afterwards, yeah, they were basically left with about like four inches of space in which they were supposed to run all their supply and return air ducts. And it just really wasn't possible. You could sort of have a very incredibly inefficient system of HEAC that's trying to run through ducts that look like that are so low and flat. And air will move, but it'll be a very, very inefficient system. Or you have to start pushing back. And that's really kind of a high level thing. You know, we're looking at a tool and how we can sort of design these different systems and intersect them. But at a higher level, yeah, you have to start thinking about, in a multidisciplinary world, what is the process like? And really, at what point you engage everyone and get the feedback from the mechanical engineer that says, you know, I'm going to need about 12 inches or 14 inches to do what I'm doing. And where does that factor in? Do you take it out of the structure? Do they push back? Does the architect need to give you more floor to floor height? You know, any of these things are potential possibilities. It's really the whole design team's problem to come up with one strategy that's going to serve all the different needs. But I just want to sort of motivate this discussion with that, because as we go through this, it's not like it's any one particular problem person's fault or problem to solve. It's really the whole team's problem to solve. And really, the only good solution is one that sort of addresses all the different needs and combines them together. Because you, know, you can really choose to optimize any one feature at the expense of other features. And it's really just how it all works together as an overall system. So kind of keep that in mind. We're going to clash things, and clashing is easy to do, but then trying to figure out how to resolve it is really the much harder thing. Okay? So we got a structure. That's our starting point. Let me switch on over to Rev and MEP instead. Kind of show you what we did there. This is pretty much the model file that you have available out there on site. <laughs> where in this model file, oh, we have the plumbing system. I have a little bit of stuff going on over here, so you'll see there actually are the toilets, the urinals, and the lavatories in there, as well as three different risers for you. We got a sanitary riser, as well as a hot water and a cold water riser. So those are available. So we'll be running some branches off there and connecting things in. Hopefully that won't be too big a hassle for you in terms of doing that. And again, you only have to do that, I think it's at the second floor level we're asking for it. So you don't need to do it, even though the fixtures are all over the entire building. We just need to do it in a small way. Okay, then in addition to the plumbing stuff. In this model, I've actually already started adding in some of the HVAC stuff. So let me kind of zoom back out and take a look at that. You'll see I've kind of put a couple different systems in here. Actually, I did two different things. I put in a sprinkler system. Okay, so what I have are a bunch of series, a little uh, kind of pendant sprinkler heads facing down, and some piping that's connecting that's all back together. Can you also have an HVAC system? And we'll go ahead and take a look at that HVAC system, because that's one you're going to have to play with a little bit where I put some main ducts in, and I put some uh, supply terminals in, and I just want to sort of connect them back together to kind of create a supply system. Okay, I could go ahead and just have a system that has a supply that's ducted, then just use like a big open air return, or I could uh, have a plenum system where I'm running the air return air through the uh, ceiling plenum. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. It really depends on your HVAC design. But let's just kind of take a look at a really simple system to get ourselves started. So if you want to follow along, please open. If you can open Revit MEP, and actually, let's go ahead and have you open the one that says, I think it's called More to Place. 
So let me go out there and yeah, open the one that says MEP model more ductwork to place because that'll give us just something to sort of play with if you want to just try running that. Let me close that up. And I'm going to go to the floor plan view, the ceiling plan, looking at level one. That way I'll be looking at level one looking upwards so I can sort of see where things are. And I'll zoom on in down there. So in this model, the way I'm looking at it right now, I've got these uh, supply air terminals kind of out here. Some of them are already ducted in. Uh, there's a main duct running back to, oh, there's probably going to be some air handler back here in the utility space. There's a main duct running out here towards the terminals. Okay, Most of them are connected in, but there are a few that aren't. These one, two, three down here just aren't connected in right yet. So if we want to go through and connect those in, I actually use sort of a two-step process for connecting them, and it's a very common thing where we'll run a hard wall duct out towards the ends of the terminals, Okay, but for that last few feet, go ahead and put in a more flexible connection that really gives you the ability to kind of uh, just bend and twist. It's a less efficient connection. I'm not sure if you've seen them. They look, they look like coiled springs that have foil. and yeah, It's a nice kind of connection because at that last few inches, if we need to sort of adjust it up or over a little bit like that, you, know, you don't have to get back to uh, reshaping sheet metal or something like that. So it gives you that flexibility. But we try to keep it as a fairly short connection because it, it is less efficient than the smooth walled, kind of hard walled ducts that run along. So if you want to play along, let's see if we can get that thing open up. Do most of you have that open up if you want to play? Beautiful. Okay, let's make it easy then. Here's what we're going to do. What we're going to do is actually just run a little bit more duct work. And I'm going to run some hard duct work. Then we're going to connect the flexi ducts. So get on down to that first floor. Say home. We'll choose, uh, where to go? A duct. As we're choosing ducts, very much like when we're choosing pipes, we just have to choose you know, kind of the size of it as well as you know, what the offset is relative to level one right now. So we're choosing a height for it. Right now, this is a rectangular duct. We could choose a different type. We can choose a round duct or some other types, too, depending on what our application is. So I'm going to just keep it as this rectangular duct for right now with T's. And what I'll do is actually, I could sort of try right into this connection here, but I'm going to actually do something to separate it by just a little bit so I don't have to kind of change that connector. And just run it down, get it close, but not quite all the way. And as I do that, see, it's ready to keep on going. So if I make a corner, it will make the corner for me. But I don't really quite want to do that. I'll take back out that piece and take out that last little piece over there. But I'm just going to run some pieces. And notice when you connect the pieces together, it's actually really smart about what it does in terms of finding all the different sort of connectors and reducers and whatever it is to make those things happen together. So that part's good. You know, it's always good at figuring out what the connections are. The hard part for you is always just getting a routing that works. And you're going to find that nine times out of ten, the issue with the routing is just the height. That somehow, if your terminals are at like, uh, like ten feet high, you have to put the ducts at an appropriate height relative to that. If you put them right at ten feet, it can't physically make the connection. So typically, we put our ducts just a little bit higher than the terminals. Okay, and that flexi duct gives you the ability to kind of like, well, let me kind of show you what I'm doing. If this is our ceiling plane, okay, and we put a air terminal here, and we have a duct running here, the problem is it's hard to make a good elbow when it's too compressed this way. It's like there's not enough room to kind of really make the elbow and get it to bend down. So flexi ducts give you the ability to do something like this. You can have the connector and Mr. Flexi, and Go ahead and make a less precise connection over there. So flexi ducts are really, really good for kind of trying to compress things into space because it's hard to sort of make the, uh, the, the sheet metal elbow to make that happen nicely. So we'll put that one in. Let me go ahead and put another one in there. Let's put a duct over here. Again, I'm just going to stay away from that connection. Bring it down over here. <coughs> a little curious if I actually put it right on the connection. Yes. Um, it's not on course. Oh, yes, no, it is in coursework. No, oh, no. Actually, this working file is not on coursework right now. This is only on the L drive right now. If you want, I can put it out on coursework. Okay. Remind me in a second. I'll put it out there for you, too. Okay. Because this is the, the partially complete one. Let's see if I can actually do it just right from the end of that, too. I want to see if it's going to be smart enough. No, I don't think it's going to be smart enough. Let's see. 
Now that's a little messy in terms of what's going on right now. It's not quite happy. So let me undo that. Looks like it's still trying to resolve it. Don't crash on me. Come on back. Place and duck. Escape. Oh, come on. <laughs> the object lesson here is <laughs> don't do things in class that you think won't work just to see if they will work, because chances are they won't, and they crash in a bad way. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I don't even know where it's off to. It's, it's, it's checked out for a moment. Let me see if there's a, some other dialogue. There's another dialogue hanging around in here. <laughs> okay, well, don't do that. Let me uh, close that one up. And we'll start that up again. Okay, let's go back to Revit MEP. Where did you go, my friend? Under Autodesk. Revit MEP. Okay, I'll put that last one in there. If you want to work the head a little bit, go ahead and just on top of those ducts that you've already put in there, for that last few feet, take a flexi duct and just go ahead and connect the, from the top of the air terminal back to uh, the main duct. Okay, and just as we're waiting for this to open up, let's just sort of comment about sort of what we expect on the assignment relative to what we're looking at here. You know, what we're looking for the assignment isn't that different from what you're looking at here. I think we say do it on one of the second floor office suites as opposed to the first floor, but it pretty much is. Put in some supply air duct or terminals, some return air terminals, and just route them together. Get the experience of putting some duct work in there, but don't really, you know, you don't have to worry about making a complete system for the entire building and the overall design, because that's not everyone's expertise in terms of doing that. We just want to give you the sense of what it feels like to place these types <coughs> of components and work with them. So I think in the assignment, we're asking you to do a supply and do a return for one of the office suites and put in an air handling unit somewhere in the utility core that they were you'd connect your ductwork to. Okay, so let me go down to that first floor again. Oops, not the floor plan. Let me look up at it. Actually, I look either way, really. Okay, and I'll do that same thing. Oops, zoom to fit. And within here, I again will run some ductwork. Coming on down. I'll come on down. Nope. Escape out of that one to close that one. I'll choose one over here. So let's go ahead and finish that out by just putting some flexi ducts in there. To do that, I'll just uh, connect from here to there, and from here to here, and finally from here to there. So this is kind of the example of what I, I, I think of this as sort of a hybrid <coughs> sort of routing where I let it do sort of what it's good at, but I try to help it out a little bit. So rather than trying to go through and have it do a complete auto routing solution, which I think is actually pretty hard for it to come up with a complete network, even if I went through and sort of laid down the main duct and then said uh, attach them there, you'd probably be pretty smart about doing it because it's a fairly simple path. You want to make its, its life fairly simple in terms of trying to figure out the paths. Okay, so go ahead and finish placing some ductwork in there and then we can start looking at really how we uh, kind of clash those things together. Actually, before we even go that far, let's uh, just kind of address some general like questions people have about like uh, you know either running piping systems or running the HVAC system. So based on what you've seen so far, does it, does it seem straightforward enough? Or what sort of questions are lurking in your mind as you think about having to do this yourself? No questions? Yes, what do you got? 
Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Ah, let, let's talk some yeah good rules of thumb. Actually, someone was asking about this because you know there's all sorts of just sort of random rules of thumb that you pick up over time in terms of working it out. Okay, one issue is you know how quick closely to space them tends to do with just you know you're you're sort of trying to move. If you use that rule of like five changes per hour, there's always some amount of air you're trying to change per hour. Okay. And a good rule of thumb that a lot of people like is around five changes per hour, but every mechanical engineer will have its own sort of cut on that. So they all have sort of a volume sort of based on, well, let's look at that. <coughs> let's come back over here. Every supply and every return let's has a volume to it. So let's take a look at what it is. This one's currently set to 500 cubic feet per minute. Okay, 500 cubic, and you can change that. You can sort of make it different. And then you know, duct work and the air handling unit will have to be sized based on that. But let's th think about how that actually works. This space that I'm trying to play with right here is essentially, let's think about it, it's about, well, it's really about like uh, 60 feet wide by 60, or 60 feet deep. Each of these are at 20 feet right now, I believe. So sort of 60 by 60 by about 12 feet tall or 10, depending on where you count the ceiling. So let's say it was 60 by 60. Okay, so that's like 3,600. Okay, and then you know, by 10 tall, so it's about 36,000. Okay, so far we have cubic feet. Okay, and now we have this whole issue of if we want to go through and change that air five times in an hour, something like that. What we can say is, okay, times five is equal to, and multiply it all together, so it's at 180. I'm bad at doing math on the floor. <laughs> okay, cubic feet per hour. Okay, so now you say, okay, let's go back and make that cubic feet per minute, because that's what really people like to do. All right, that's how people think about sizing these things. So if we divide that through by 60, what is that going to be? Is it going to be 30? Three, thank you. So 3,000 cubic feet per minute. So we're going to divide through by 60. Okay, so we need about 3,000 cubic feet per minute. So if each of these are 500, so we got eight of them right now, that'd actually probably be appropriate. I could probably get by with six of them. Okay, if I, so I'm, mov I'm moving more air, so I could have more terminals with less velocity, or I could have uh, fewer terminals with more velocity. Yeah, but you got to sort of balance it out. But those numbers do come from somewhere. Okay, <coughs> to balance it, you should have the same amount of supply as you have return. Okay, otherwise you have this imbalance and problems. You don't want to be pulling things off of a, or you don't want to be pulling the doors open or something like that, or pushing the doors open if things are out of balance. You got to keep the air in balance. Then once you figure out that you need these, the general scheme that is often used is we tend to put supplies, it's going to sound weird, but we, we tend to put them near the cold air surfaces. So we'll put them near windows and doors and things like that. Because the way most systems tend to be designed is we put the warm air out or the cool air out near the exterior surfaces, and we put the return air back towards the middle with the idea that we sort of you know, condition the space out at the at interface where it's probably going to get the worst, and then we sort of draw the dead air back towards the core of the building. So a very common thing would be to put the supplies out here, then put the return back over here somewhere, because you want them separated so that there's kind of like a flow <coughs> to the whole thing. So if there's a, you just don't want still air, you want air to move all the time. So if you put a lot of returns in there, maybe I'd put the supplies here and put the returns right down the center or something like that. But just something, you know, we do returns in funny ways. Sometimes we dry air out to the hallway or something like that and put the returns out there with the idea that the air is going to get sucked out through the doors or under the doors because there's actually usually a pretty reasonable crack under there. But the general principle is, yeah, supply towards the kind of coldest surfaces or the, the ones that are most affected by the environment, the return towards the middle, and then just keep them balanced. So does that sort of make sense? Okay, no worries. Other random rules. Someone was asking about the whole notion of uh, like piping and if are there good rules for piping and all that type of stuff. And what is, um, let's you know, try and run through some of those together. Um, sanitary drain lines. If you have a drain line that's coming off of a toilet or something like that, those tend to be four inches. It just has to do with the connections that are on uh, toilet fixtures. 
you know, just the drain line that needs to be big enough to go ahead and remove all the waste and make sure there's no clogging. It's about four inches. So sanitary fixtures typically have like a four inch drain. Um, or I should say toilets. Other things like uh, sinks and urinals and fixtures don't have uh, nearly as much flow. They just have liquid fluid flowing from them for the most of the time. Tend to be, oh, they could be inch and a half or they could be two inches. It just sort of depends on like the specific unit. So it's usually somewhere in there. So I'll say that's like a sink. What else do you need to know about in terms of uh, the slope? What is it, quarter inch per 12 inches? I'm always bad on that because the plumbers always need to take care of that. So if you have sloping lines, okay, and drain lines are the ones that need to slope. Well, supply lines don't need to slope. But if drain lines are sloping, it's like about a quarter inch slope per 12 inches is required. You could have more than that. That'll just make sure that it drains even better, but it can't get any flatter than that. Anyone else you know? In terms of cold water and hot water supply lines, again, that'll sort of vary. It really depends on how much capacity you need at the tail end. If you are running to a single fixture, you could probably get by with a half inch or a three quarter inch line. If you're feeding like a whole series of fixtures, it'll often start as a two inch line, then get down to a one inch line, then get down to a three quarter inch line close to the ends. So there's ways of computing all that. But the cool thing is, if you really design your systems nicely within here, it'll actually help you size all that stuff. So it's kind of the next generation, or the next step in this whole process would be to say, hey, this is a system. Go ahead and help me size all the pipes, or even size all the ductwork, because the ductwork has that same sort of issue. This ductwork really does have a size that needs to be based on how much air you're trying to push through it. And we can use it to kind of figure that out. Yeah, you have a question? Yes. Say again? Yes. Yes? No, usually, I'd say pipes tend to run through cavities. And ultimately, there are like uh, attachments, like hangers or brackets that actually hold them to the walls. For the purpose of what we're doing, just leave them floating free. OK, but yeah, exactly. Oh, well, it'll take care of it. <laughs> now, it's, it, that's really sort of a level of detail where, at least at this stage of the process, we don't get into it. You're going to find later on, like if you're doing a big hospital project, some of the things you guys have been working on in the CEM, and so you see that DPR is working on, there they actually care about every last hanger and precisely where everything's getting down to the nearest inch. Because there's just so much stuff that's moving through there that you need to coordinate all that stuff. For, but for the level of detail we're doing, I wouldn't worry about it just yet. For the, uh, the turn? Yes. There's a whole other system. You need one, air, one system that pops out and another one that pops in. And then there'll be this thing called this air handler back here, which will have a <laughs> supply side and it'll have a return side. So and returns are the ones that are a little bit more flexible. Supply, it's, we pretty much got to get the air where it wants to go. Return, you have these different strategies. Sometimes we put in ducts. Sometimes we just sort of uh, put in registers and we have a ceiling plenum. So we have a space between the ceiling and the floor above. And we just pull all the air through that and kind of really use it like a gigantic duct. And that's a really common system. In fact, most of what's going on in here, I think, probably is done that way. Okay. But then you also have this thing where, oh, you know, you'll have like a big open space. Like if this were a big retail space, we could just have some like a very high wall here and some grills on the side wall and just pull all the return out that way. Yeah. So it's people tend to be pretty simplistic on the return side, but very precise on the supply side. But yeah, if you're going to duct it, it's, just, it's two separate things, which makes, if you go back to the original story about the four global AEC team, with their four inches of room to kind of put everything in there, if you have to not only get supply ducts, but you also have to get return ducts, and think about, you know, they can't go through each other. They have to go one over or around, or it takes some careful planning to figure out a good routing to keep these things from running into each other. So, and yeah, that's where the insight comes in all this stuff. It's pretty easy to put the pipes in. And the question is really how to route everything in such a way that everyone's needs are met. <laughs> and that's probably the most classic problem we have on any commercial site these days. Every individual discipline, we're pretty good at doing. But as we run into these strange conflicts in the field, because somehow we just didn't consider everyone else's needs. Nah, we won't worry about that for now. Again, it, it's a, from the air handler, yeah, whether there's some grills that are blowing it out to the building or there's some sort of exhaust that's going up through 
Like really, this whole building was designed with the notion that there's some sort of utility shaft in there and that we could run things up or down. Yeah. In fact, even then, you know, the air handler's just sort of pushing air. There's probably some chillers or some heating or condensers. Or there's something going on somewhere else that's supplying the system. So we're definitely doing a slice of the system. In the same way that for the plumbing, we're not actually worrying where that drain water goes to. You're just sort of taking it down to the basement somewhere. Okay, and we're not worried where the, the ultimate, the inlet for all the water's coming into the system. Okay, because, yeah, that's, there's a whole another discipline to how to design all that stuff. So just want to give you a high-level sense of it.